Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Gregory Wolpert coming to you from Quito, Ecuador. On Monday, the Trump administration presented its plan to roll back federal financial regulations that were implemented with the so-called Dodd-Frank Act of 2009. The plan intends to dramatically scale back the regulations that were passed shortly after the Great Financial Recession of 2007-2008 and complement similar rollback efforts in the House of Representatives. As a matter of fact, last week, the House also passed a repeal of the Dodd-Frank Act re regulations. Uh, here are two ex excerpts from that debate by House Majority Leader Paul Ryan and Democratic Congressman Keith Ellison. Small businesses are struggling. They have been unable to hire, invest, or get the loans that they need to get off the ground. Families looking to keep their money safe are hit with fees that they cannot afford. And why is this? Our community banks are in trouble. They're being crushed by the costly rules imposed on them by the Dodd-Frank Act. This law may have had good intentions, but its consequences have been dire for Main Street. Let me put it this way. It is more than a thousand pages long and has more rules and regulations than any other Obama-era law. You know, since Dodd-Frank's passage, the economy has created over 16 million jobs, over 85 months of consecutive job growth. Business lending, business lending has increased 75 percent, and banks, large and small, are posting all-time record profits. Community banks are outperforming larger banks. Credit unions are expanding their membership. And oh, because of the work of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, 29 million people have seen $12 billion get back into their pocket and not into those of uh, unprop improper and illegal practicing uh, financial services firms. Now the repeal goes to the Senate, where it faces much, a much tougher battle to pass. Joining us to analyze the financial regulation repeal uh, is Bill Black. Bill is Associate Professor of Economics and Law at the University of Missouri at Kansas City. He's author of The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One. Thanks for being here again, Bill. Thank you. So as we saw in the clip, um, Dodd-Frank Act regulations are really complicated. Uh, they encompass over a thousand pages. So we're going to have to limit ourselves to a few key areas that it covers. Let's start with the Republicans' main claim, though. Uh, that the law and its regulations are too complicated and that this is strangling small businesses and small bank loans. And, um, and uh, Representative uh, Keith Ellison challenges this claim by presenting numbers that would indicate that there's no relationship between the regulations uh, and uh, the state of small banking. What, what do you say to, to, to this debate? All right, so the first part of Ryan's critique is obviously correct. Uh, the regulations are uh, enormous and uh, ultra, ultra complicated, and uh, they are a field day for lawyers that have made big law firms very, very rich. Um, so what can we say in general about this? Uh, first thing is, um, the Republicans are not uh, stupid in this regard they understand the politics which is claim that you're doing things for small banks which are much more popular with people and actually use this as your pretext to relieve the largest banks of um, any kind of regulations they don't really like. Uh, what I can tell you as a former financial regulator is it is always the case that when you see a rule that is exceptionally complicated it is complicated in that manner because the industry wanted it that way. In particular, the biggest, in, in this context, banks wanted it that way. And the, they like complex rules because, of course, it's much cheaper for them to hire a lawyer to do it once for the operations of a, what are literally $2 trillion banks. Um, than for a small bank to be able to do that work. So it creates a competitive advantage for them if they make the rules very complicated. So that's the first reason. The second reason is Dodd-Frank was largely stupid uh, in the sense that there was no coherent understanding of what caused the financial crisis or past financial crises or future financial crises. So the individual ideas were not necessarily stupid. Here's a sort of good idea. Here's another sort of good idea. 
And then, you know, you have hundreds of legislators coming up with this stuff from thousands of lobbyists, and they throw it all together, and there's nothing coherent about it, and it doesn't deal with the underlying causes very well. So that was the second problem, major problem. A third major problem is Dodd-Frank simply wasn't bold. Um, and it was, again, stupidly not bold. It needed to be bold to deal with uh, the most significant problems, many of which were old problems that we had fixed in the past. So, for example, um, they refused to reinstate Glass-Steagall even though Glass-Steagall had worked brilliantly for over a half century, and even though ever since we started to gut Glass-Steagall, which we did by uh, regulatory interpretations long before it was effectively repealed uh, under President Clinton, it has produced one problem after another. So you could have saved literally, you know, literally, um, 70 pages of legislation and uh, literally uh, it's, it's actually not a thousand pages of regulations, it's several thousand pages of regulation required. You could have saved at least 200 pages of regulation if you had said instead, the law repealing Glass-Steagall is repealed, right? <laughs> and Glass-Steagall is back. Uh, that would have taken about nine words. Uh, and you would have uh, had a dramatically more effective situation. Similarly, one of the true outrages is when uh, when Brooksley Bourne, then the chair of the Commodities Future Trading Commission, tried to protect us from financial derivatives. And a bipartisan coalition came together to produce one of the worst acts of legislation ever, Commodities Future Modernization Act, um, under Clinton again, uh, that uh, removed all ability to regulate financial derivatives. Well, instead of simply repealing that obscene act, they spent 70 pages doing something in between, and then they created half-assed sort of uh, kind of uh, approaches to this, which are nowhere near as effective. And because they're not clean exclusions, we try, because they try to carve out really complex situation, they go on for hundreds of pages and they're still going to be ineffective because they're easy to evade. But Representative Ellison is also correct that none of this has anything to do with the economy. The uh, economy is not being constrained by lack of lending. In fact, uh, the banks are sitting on tons of money that they could lend. It's being constrained by the fact that businesses don't see very productive investments that they're going to make. And it, you've seen all the reluctance even to simply hire people back full time and to bring people who uh, have became so discouraged that they dropped out of the labor force back in. You've seen that wages uh, have stalled for all these years. These are the problems, not uh, anything to do uh, with uh, Dodd-Frank uh, as uh, slowing down the recovery. So it's a non sequitur, but it is true that the legislation is often poor. Now, at the right, treasury uh, level, let me just uh, interrupt you for a second. I just want to focus on one of the things that uh, that uh, has gotten a lot of attention, which was the uh, Volcker rule, the so-called Volcker rule, which I guess is supposed to, in some ways, replace uh, the idea of the Glass-Steagall Act. Um, just to, can you describe what it's about and uh, and uh, what uh, eliminating this so-called Volcker rule would do? Yeah, that's what the one I was talking about, where they refused to simply blink, bring back Glass-Steagall. Instead, they tried to do this ultra-complicated carve-out. Um, now, no criticism of Volcker. This is the best he could do. He, you know, they refused to bring back Glass-Steagall. So he said, "Well, you should." prevent proprietary trading uh, by banks. Proprietary trading is when you trade um, these kind of investment banking. So this is where you are not making loans as a bank, you're taking an ownership position, you're buying stock or derivatives. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, say so you shouldn't allow that because that's much riskier and creates conflicts of interest. But then you have to distinguish proprietary trading for when they trade for their customers and that gets into intent, which they can easily mask. 
So then there are hundreds of pages to try to prevent evasions, and then the big banks came back and said, but, but in this situation that'd be unfair, so then they create hundreds of pages of exceptions to it, and the result is something that is exceptionally expensive, is still easy to evade, won't achieve its purpose, and, you know, yes, I can understand why you would go after the Volcker rule, but what you should do is simply bring back Glass-Steagall. More broadly, they're creating something very dangerous. <clears throat> and this is particularly in the Treasury variant. So, as you said, there are two initiatives, one by the House, now in the Senate, to basically repeal everything. And then Treasury is saying, well, no, 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 just change some two really big things. The one really big thing is that they're going after the um, Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. And the reason they're doing this is it is by far the most effective, most important part of Dodd-Frank. And, of course, it was so effective because it was designed by um, now Senator Warren, then Professor Warren, Elizabeth Warren. And industry, the finance industry, hates them with a purple passion. So they're going to gut the CFPB. The second thing <coughs> is going to be the get-out-of-jail-free card for the big banks from all effective regulation. It's an idea that sounds neat to a number of folks. It's, hey, why don't we distinguish between banks that have a very high capital levels and banks that don't have such a high capital level. If they've got a real high capital level, A, they got a protection against loss, and B, they should have the right incentives. They've got a lot of their own money at risk not to do wild and crazy things. So if they have high capital, why don't we just let them do pretty much whatever they want? Well, the problem is all the fraud schemes that actually have produced the huge losses and our recurrent financial crises, what do they do? They re create huge reported capital <coughs> that is fictional. In other words, in precisely the situations you most need effective regulation, they're about to get rid of effective regulation on the basis of supposed capital that will prove to be fictional capital uh, whenever there's actually a serious problem. So this is a disastrous idea uh, that's getting almost no attention uh, in the press, uh, the fact that uh, the implications are fraud. Just before we have to go, um, I just want to know, what, uh, how do you see the chances that these financial regulations uh, rollback will pass? Uh, I mean, as a law, it still needs to go back through the Senate, where it needs, uh, where it'll probably need 60 votes, uh, and there's talk of uh, bypassing the Senate. What do you think will happen there? The Republicans can create a bill that is uh, purportedly oriented towards small banks that will pick up um, at least 10 Democrats, maybe more, uh, in the Senate. And in the past, when they've done this, has picked up uh, as many as 40 or 50 Democratic votes in the House. So we'll have to see how far they push it. If, if they really want legislation to get through, there is a way to draft it, as I say, using the pretext that you're doing it for small banks uh, that will cause material defections from Democrats. Well, we're certainly going to continue to follow this story. So we were talking to Bill Black, professor of economics and law at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Thanks so much for your time, Bill. Thank you. And thank you for watching and supporting the Real News Network.